Hello and welcome to episode number 372 of Smart Podcast Trashy Books. I'm Sarah Wendell from Smart Bitches Trashy Books and with me today is J.N. Welsh. I have sat next to Jen Welsh at several book signings because that's how the alphabet works, Wendell Welsh. And I'll be honest, when you're in the W's, you're at the far side of the room, you have all of the AC and we have really fun conversations So I thought you might like to listen in. We are going to talk about so many different things. We talk about DJ school, we talk about meditation, and we talk about her job as an adjunct professor of sign language. There's a lot to enjoy. I hope you enjoy listening to our conversation as much as I enjoy sitting next to her at book signings. This podcast is being brought to you by Fallen by Rebecca Zanetti. And prepare your catnip bingo cards for the following description. Okay, you got your pencils? You ready? All right, here we go. Best-selling author Rebecca Zanetti's second deep ops, Fallen, is sharp and dynamic, raves the New York Times. Brimming with action, suspense, and sensual tension, a talented hacker turned security consultant and her FBI-appointed bodyguard must fake an engagement in order to clear her father's name from a high-profile mob scandal. Fallen by Rebecca Zanetti is on sale wherever books are sold. For more information, visit RebeccaZanetti.com. Every episode of this here podcast receives a transcript, and every transcript is hand-compiled by Garlic Knitter. Thank you, Garlic Knitter. This week's transcript is being underwritten by the podcast Patreon community. Thank you. If you've supported the show in the monthly pledge, you are making sure that every episode is accessible, and I and many other people appreciate that very, very much. If you would like to join the Patreon community and support the show, have a look at patreon.com slash smartbitches. Monthly pledges, $1 a month at the starting level, and there's so many opportunities to support the show. So thank you in advance for your consideration, and thank you to the Patreon community for making sure this episode has a transcript. I will have information at the end of the episode about the music we are listening to, about what's coming up on Smart Bitches next week. I'll have an absolutely terrible joke, and of course I will have links to all of the books and music that we talk about in this episode. So let's get started. On with my interview with J.N. Welsh. My name is J.N. Welsh, and I write romance, contemporary romance, featuring multicultural um, women of color, um, mostly interracial, and these women are looking for love, mostly in the big city. And um, it's very humorous, so I feel like that is kind of like who I am as an author. Um, On the other side of my life, I'm an educator a wellness warrior, and a professor. You do a lot of things. I do. (laughs) I do. I think that that just kind of comes naturally with, like, interest Mm -hmm. and what it is that you want to do and how uh, when you're, like, going one direction, you can always find other opportunities that come your way. Yes. And if you're open to them, you recognize them. Yeah, you do definitely have to be open to them or else you'll just, it's so interesting because when you're, if you ever sit down and say, okay, now I want to reinvent myself, you forget a whole spectrum of things that you can do and you just focus on maybe what you're academically trained in or what you're doing now as that set of skills and that's all you have, but it's not, it can, it, it can be so much broader than that if we just kind of take a minute to like think and brainstorm and say hey you know I'm actually quite social so maybe I can do something like on that like on that side of career spectrum but we don't think in those super broad terms you know we only Mm -hmm. think about what's present so and it's also hard sometimes to recognize how an interest that you have can be something that you pursue and sometimes recognizing that you have an interest and that you want to pursue it doesn't necessarily mean you need to make it a job or or monetize it or leverage or do any of those buzzy words. You could just do something to enjoy it. Yes, exactly. So many things. Like I love music, but I can't see oh, myself. Oh, I couldn't tell at all from the topics of your books. <laughs> That's a complete surprise to me. Right. I know. Who knew? Um, but it's like I would. I don't think that I would ever like go into the music industry because it's so it's I think it's it it can be great but I also you also hear like so many things about it and I feel like it like being act like doing the work Mm -hmm. in the industry would ruin my love for the music so uh I just kind of like want to just 
be, I think I just want to enjoy music for what it is and what it can bring to my life and how excited that I get and all the other things that are around it is as a, as a consumer of music instead of someone who like either creates music or is in the industry Mm -hmm. or, you know, that kind of thing. So is that what led you to writing romances set in the EDM world? Yes, it definitely started out with an interest. Like I was, you know, I was writing before that. I was doing like some um, romantic suspense. I, put, you know, did like short stories and uh, an, another contemporary that wasn't set in in, a mu- in the music world. But mm-hmm. I was literally at home minding my own business. <laughs> we turned on the TV and I saw this electronic DJ on, and his name was Cascade, and I was just listening to the music and I was like, Oh my goodness, this is so beautiful. This like the lyrics, the music. And even though it was electronic, it was so like universal. It was specific to electronic, but it was just like a universal feel good song and very warm and very emotional. And I was like, I love this. And growing up, I think we all have had some exposure to like techno or trip house or anything like that mm-hmm. in the being in clubs. Like we've heard electronic music in some shape or form, but when he played it and he was like the DJ on the stage and I must have missed that whole period of time because <laughs> DJs became, like the soul, like the artist on stage that you, that you stand there and watch. And he was playing to a crowd and it was just so great. And I was like, Oh, I have to know who this guy is. I have to know what the song is. And so that led me down the rabbit hole to go find out what the song was, who he was, who, he, you know, and he's amazing, who he worked with on that song, who was Dead Mouse. Um, if anybody knows him, he yep. did a song like that was really popular called Raise Your Weapon that had like a sick drop in it. That was like, it was just a lovely song. And then it like had this sick drop that was like, wow, this is amazing. So you had to kind of love them for that. And that's kind of like, you know, it's like you're sitting there and you're ruminating and saying, what if a DJ (laughs) Mm -hmm. and at first it was actually a fan and a fan got together. And so the book like started out as a DJ and a fan. And then it kind of like blew up into like the industry, like on its, you know, on its edits, because it was like, well, how do I get them to be together? And it made more sense to have them be working together. And then it became a workplace romance, but that's how it started. And I mean, talk about inspiration like that. It That really did inspire me because I was like, oh, my God, I love this. I just want to consume all his music, which I did. And then it just was like, oh, you know, when you're driving, what if, what if? And yep. I love those moments. And when you can match the, the, the emotion of the song to a scene. Yes. That's, oh my God. Th- that's hard work, but it's so worth it. It is. So it's, it really is worth it. And it's, you know, like, you know, when you see on on Twitter and you see authors like with gifs, like crying because they finally figured out a scene, like it, it literally is like that because you're like, wow, how, how can I translate this on paper? Mm -hmm. How do I write down this emotion? How can I, how can I get people to feel this? Because you know, people say, oh, yeah, I went to a show and it, and it definitely like feels like it. But if you've never been to a show, if you've never been to a club, how do you how do I get that person to like buy into where they are and really kind of lose themselves in that moment? And it was hard work, but it was definitely worthwhile. So have you always been a romance reader? Is that part of what led you into the genre? Yes, I was. I like I, when I was younger, I ingested like all books and then (laughs) like all books like I remember do you remember I I might be dating myself but you know like they used to have troll and scholastic and you can like check off the books that you wanted and then they the teacher would like get them and then they give them to you and then you like yes (laughs) oh my goodness I used to check so many books off and then like before the summer was over my mother was like I don't know what's wrong with my child because she like is just reading so much and so then I started to like look at this, what was on the bookshelves. And my mother would get a lot of donations of books. Even if she wasn't reading them, she just get a, a lot of donations. And my sister would always have like these, I don't know, these books with these 
couples on there and these like weird, like awkward, like looking like lovey and things like that and kissing. And I was like, what's this Harlequin thing? (laughs) (laughs) And she's like, you can't read that. And I was like, oh, yes, I can. And so I would steal them. Always. Either you get them from someone or you steal them from (laughs) someone. So I steal them and then, you know, I try to make the bookshelf look like, you know, it wasn't empty and that. <laughs> and I would read them and I really like fell I like really fell in love with just reading romance. And I remember as I got older and I started to, you know, when you write notes in class because you're bored with your friends and you started to like boys and I remember very clearly writing with a friend of mine a note back and forth and we were talking about what it would be like to date this boy. And then I just took it further. You know, there was conflict, there was marriage and kids and a happily ever after. You went all in. I went all in. I (laughs) I actually have the note that we wrote and it's like, it's like, it has to be like six or seven pages of a note and we just wrote a story out. It was so much fun. Um, and I think that ever since then I was like, wow, I, you know, I really, I really like enjoy doing that. And, but you know, when you're younger and everyone's telling you to like, you know, be a lawyer or Mm -hmm. be an educator or be this or be that because writing can't really do, you know, things for you. Um, you know, you sort of put it down, you put it, you put it, um, to the side and it's never, Oh, I can maybe do both. Or maybe I can try to see if I can fit both in, you know, it's, it's one or the other, at least back then it was. Now I think people are a little bit more flexible with that kind of thing. So yeah, uh, (laughs) I, I always like once I, once I got into romance, I was hooked line and sinker (laughs) was never any going back and I always like read and it took me a while to start writing but I always read I loved to read romance it's addictive once you start right it's it's really hard to to be to it's hard to explain to people who don't get it and it's hard to put it down yes because I treat people like, well, why do you read? And I was like, have you ever like really read one? And I, it's amazing to me how many people say that they 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 have opinions about romance, but they haven't read romance. Yes, they just read one romance that happens to be the one romance that was like maybe not as great as some of the ones that really kind of like, you know, really take you on this this escapist journey. You know what I mean? And. It's it's hard to like put into words why we love romance and it's and it's not like we're sitting here women unrealistic and saying oh yeah like it, it, you know what I mean like we understand that we're reading fantasy we really love the way that it makes us feel we really like the stories we I learned so much from every romance book oh my gosh me too there's just so many layers it's such a dynamic genre like I don't understand like. It, it really blows my mind when people say, oh, it's just romance. And I'm like, wow, you're missing out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> missing out. So we've touched on this a little bit, but your first book, In Tune, and your next book, In Rhythm, are both set in the world of EDM. And they have yeah. DJ heroes. And I, I find that, like you, I find that entire performance world so interesting. What specifically led you into that world for your books? What was the point where you were like, I know exactly what I want to do with this book. I know how I want to write in tune. I know how I want to write in rhythm. Do you remember your entry point? I do. And it was um, a few different things. One was, you know, of course, once I found this DJ, I had to go and see I had to go and see him perform. And so I went to, I remember it was Las Vegas and he had a residency at um, the Cosmopolitan. I think it was Marquis at the Cosmopolitan. And I went and I was like, okay, this is my first show. Let me go and see how this, this actually looks like. And this was just me personally. Mm-hmm. You know, what is the, what is the draw of bringing, of, of going to see a DJ and not just listening to the music. And they are managing so many things on the stage, but they're also interacting with the crowd. They are, some of them actually do like jump around the stage and run around the stage. And yeah. Some things like p- prepared and they are in, simultaneously like, depending on which DJ you're watching, simultaneously looking at the crowd and making sure that 
they're that everybody's still engaged so they'll do like a call and response there's so much involved Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I'm like wow this is exhausting it has to be if it's exhausting for me to watch you and to enjoy it it has to be exhausting for you to like do all this so you know DJs are not just you know, spinning vinyl records. Now they are producers who are working with like, you know, bigger name artists and doing all these remixes. They, a lot of them say that, and it is actually, because when I was doing my research, I actually went to a DJ school. I went to Scratch DJ Academy. No way. That's so cool. (laughs) I did. Uh, a cousin of mine, she o- has always wanted to um, learn how to DJ. And I was like, well, you know, I said, I really want to know also how, like, like I grew up, I mean, people don't really don't know this, but my father was a DJ. So I always grew up with DJ music around and he would, you know, he's Jamaican. So he would play like at a tiny club and he just like spin his like vinyl and so and bring his crates around. So I've always kind of had it in my life. So it's just sort of so interesting how I've come to like, you know, still love the evolution of the DJ as they are today. So we went to DJ school and in actually doing it, it's a very simple process, but the creativity is where it gets super interesting. How do you mix music? How do you find these entry points to like mix music? The effects that you put on it, you have to be somewhat ambidextrous. It's, I mean, there's, it's it just gets bigger and bigger but mm-hmm. the, the beginning point of it is so simple and it's still and it's also a lot of fun because you're like oh wow I get to like <laughs> I get to like spin records and you know do all this kind of stuff but I think that it's the in terms of the entry point I feel like learning and understanding that and really feeling like what it's like to manage all that gives me like an edge to kind of then try to explain that on paper. If I have nothing and all I'm doing is researching sort of like a flat document and words, um, explaining it, I don't really get the same feel. So I really have to get a little more tactile with it and say, okay, what does this feel like? What does the vinyl feel like? How are people doing it? Are they using Serato? Are they using CDJ? Like, what does that look like? What does that feel like? What does that allow the DJ to do when he's not, you know, um, you know, focusing on the screen and can now interact with people. It's just so much involved with it. Mm-hmm. So I feel like in doing my research, because I love to do research, uh, <laughs> I can sit for days, <laughs> months. And I think that that's how I, I got this, this kind of like really like hands-on feel for what it would be like to do that. Now, I never did it in front of like huge crowds, right? Mm-hmm. Because that's a whole other element. Like if you've ever watched a awards show and they show you the pers- perspective of the artist on stage and you're like, oh, my God, like my heart stops because I'm like these people, everybody's just sitting there just staring at you. <laughs> right? It's a little intimidating. It is so intimidating. And that's whether or not like you're doing a, they, like you get some people don't even get any feedback whether or not they're doing a good job. You know what I mean? At least with the DJ. You know, they're bouncing up and down and the crowd is like cheering them on and waving their flags. There's just so many, you know, like physical cues that you're doing a good job and that they're having a good time. That's incredible. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, I think. Did you get to use uh, any of your dad's music in DJ school? Um, I didn't because <laughs> um, we had like... I. A lot of the my father's records aren't on. Um, they aren't on uh, digital. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, they are on digital, and even like in the ter- in terms of how I was learning, I was learning sort of like the more updated way of DJing, which is to use like Serato, and then you. It looks like you have. It looks like a vinyl record, but it's all digital music. So you can change the music on the screen. And then because you're using a needle and a vinyl record that is sort of like um, connected to that, you know, it transmits to the speakers. So it's all digital music, which is um, CDJ is another one which doesn't even use vinyl. So you can scratch and all kinds of stuff with Serato if you wanted to. That's Um, so cool. 
Yeah, like there's so many different levels. There were there were DJs there who just did vinyl. And so they'd have like these scratch competitions and things like that. My DJ teachers were are pretty amazing. They were really sweet as well. Um and I got a lot of a lot of information from them and was able to kind of go to clubs and after I learned something see them in action. So that was yeah. So I couldn't use his records, but I always like like my father still plays now, but um those are such like it's such a vinyl is so rich like you have to kind of be like a vinyl enthusiast and there's still a lot of vinyl djs out there playing like i wouldn't say you can kind of say they're like kind of like on the underground but they're doing it's more like the purest form and so they're doing a lot of djing outside of you know this sort of like dance music scene and just kind of like bringing people together and you know, having fun, like the old school way. What for you are the easiest and most fun parts of writing? And what parts are most challenging for you? I know you love research. So that must be both both things easy and challenging. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it could be like, when it comes to research is that there is such a thing as too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's such a thing as too much. And I'm always like, this is, you know, I'm like, I always get that kind of feedback where it's like, you don't really kind of need that detail. Like you can kind of take that chunk out, you know? So, (laughs) but I love dialogue. I love listening to people talk. I listen a lot. (laughs) I just love listening to, to the rhythm of people talking. So I feel like one of the things that I do really well is dialogue and, and, and escalating dialogue. You know, I feel like I do that. I do that pretty well. And it, it, you know, I try to keep it natural and funny and use everything that, you know, we kind of have today because that just makes sense, right? Texting and, you know, sort of sort of the slang, the current slang things that were, you know, that are a little bit more universal now instead of just like, you know, certain groups are using them or, you know, um, they're a little bit more universal. Mm-hmm. So I feel like that is something that I, um, something that I do really well, but that I can also find challenging because you want to make sure that, the dialogue does help to, you know, move the plot along and in a way that is natural and makes sense. Um, and not just sort of, sort of out of the blue, oh, let's just throw that in there because we need to have them be in, you know, in some sort of discord right now, you know? So I like to like it when it flows, just like the music, you know, sort of Mm -hmm. like, so I find that to be, um, that I do that well, but it's also a little bit challenging, um, as well as all the detail involved with, all the research that I gather. I would love to ask you more about DJing because it's such a collection please. of skills. Yeah, please do. Like there's so much in there. How do you convey that in writing? And what are the parts of actually learning to DJ that you found to be the most interesting? Like what part could you be like, I could do this any day. Just give me the equipment. I could do this all day. Definitely like looking for music. Yes. It's like research. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I could, I mean, re- I remember sp- I was spending hours and, and people know this for me, like, because when I used to, and my friends know it as well, because when I used to have my, like, I used to have, do like barbecues, I used to do these small events at my house. It'd be a barbecue, it'd be a wine and cheese, and it'd be like a, a, a weenie roast. <laughs> and I spent hours looking for just play playlist music to play while people were there and it would span like the time of the event. And I loved doing that and putting music together and putting moods together and like, okay, at this time people probably had a couple of drinks, so they might want to like dance a little bit. Like, yeah, I loved doing that. And then like the wind down music, you know, like you gotta kind of have to wrap it up. The neighbors might start complaining. Let's tone it down. Like I loved doing that and searching for music and finding new music like I found like if anybody you know if you know um dubstep of oh, absolutely so one of the songs just to um I love Bob there's, a, there's my favorite Bob Marley song is called Sun is Shining it is one it is probably my one of my it is probably my favorite song and I found a dubstep version of that song no way it did it is so cool. <laughs> it's so cool. So in doing that and being part of, you know, the DJ school and having to perform and DJ to pass the classes. Right. I 
like I had to put music together and I really wanted to like impress my teachers and like have people, you know, the other students in the class be like, wow, that was unexpected. You know, that I love because it like it may it gives me so much joy when I'm like people are like, oh, I get it. That's cool. And they smile like so I can only imagine what it's like for a DJ who is not just pulling music, but actually producing music, creating music, putting you know, instruments and people and vocals together and they come out with a like a hit song like Cascade did with I Remember, which was the first song that I heard Mm -hmm. and having it like blow up. Like it has to feel like so good when people just get it, you know, because they simultaneously are getting you, you know? Oh, yeah. It's so I think that's so cool. And you're creating a sort of soundscape that is the background and then later is the reason is the thing that people are paying attention to. Right. That's hard. It's hard to go from like a background music that doesn't overwhelm the part where say people are sitting and eating and can talk to the part where the music gets louder so they can go dance. Like that's, yeah. that takes skill. That's, that's not easy. It is. It's to the future. It's like, it's like the music is the feature. I always say like, Oh, here's my appetizer. This, 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 this song is more like an appetizer. Like, Oh, oh that's and cool. This, this is like, like the main course. You know, yeah. all music for me is like, it can, like, it's hard for me sometimes. Like I have to put, I'd rather put on the the TV and watch and put on a movie that I've seen like a hundred times as like background noise than music because I'll get distracted by, oh my God, that song is so cool. Oh, I haven't heard that song in a long time. Like I'll get distracted a little bit, but if I need like the mood, then I'll really like put the song on so that I can hear it and be like, okay. And then I'll turn it down and then I'll try to write. But it's always the the main course for me. That is fascinating. Yeah. Because I am the exact opposite. I can't have words when I'm writing or working. It has to be music. And I have this massive list of music that I listen to in the background. Um, all of these different places where I have things that I will listen to when I'm working, but I only listen when I'm working because I can't have the television or people talking because I'm going to start eavesdropping on all the dialogue. <laughs> I get it. Yeah, <laughs> I do get it. I think I, I think I had that moment when fatal uh, fatal attraction was on, and I was like, "Wait a second, I haven't seen this in like quite a few years," and it just became the most interesting thing to me. I was like, "Okay, I'll take the break and watch a bit of it, but I have to turn it off now because." It's like it has become new again because it's so many years since I've seen it. And I was like, wow, you know, when you get older and your perspectives change and then you watch a movie that you saw when you were younger, it's so different. It's so it, it blows your mind. Oh, I, yeah. Just people do that. Do it with like Pretty Woman. If you haven't watched it in a long time or the attraction, like go get these. They're really quite interesting boomerang like your perspective changes as you get older you know oh absolutely there are so many things that I will re-experience and look at with everything that I have learned and um, grown to understand now that I'm so much older and they just look and sound so different yes right sometimes in a good way sometimes sometimes not so much yes so true yep Mm mm-hmm So I know from sitting next to you at RWA signings, because Team W, and all the air conditioning, that you are also an instructor of American Sign Language. Yes. I'm an adjunct professor at a college for uh, American Sign Language and Deaf Culture. That's incredible. How did you get started? Could you t- could you share more about that part of your life? I think it's so interesting, especially juxtaposed with EDM, because that is often music that you feel as well as hear. Yes, very true. Right. So um, when I was in high school, um, we had a fl- we had actually a, a deaf floor. So it was like for hearing impaired and deaf students and a friend of mine with some other teachers and counselors kind of came up with this buddy program Mm -hmm. and as one of her friends of course I got dragged into it and we were paired up with um uh with a hearing impaired student or a deaf student and my friend was hearing impaired but she was very fluent in sign language so she signed all the time and I thought it was so beautiful and of course I had a great experience doing that buddy program and then I just sort of forgot about it you know kind of went through college and then my last year of college 
I wasn't really sure. I knew that I was probably going to go into education at some point, but I really wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do. And this is like senior year, so kind of had to get your life together. <laughs> and I <laughs> and I took a sign language class and I fell in love with it all over again, like to the point where I was like, I don't know what to do with my life right now. Like it's it was just like so it was like you know when you people say you have a calling and you just feel like drawn to it I was really like drawn to it to a point where I was like I have to make this a career in some way shape or form and I had no idea how I was going to do that because in my um uh in my senior year that was a minor in French and I was leaving the country to go to to be in France for a year so I was like, oh, am I supposed to go to graduate school? Am I supposed to go get another? So she said, like, I didn't know what to do. So I had to do all this research and figure out what I was doing. Was I not going to France? Was I, you know, so I ended up going to France. And when I came back, I went to graduate school for deaf education. And after that, I taught in Hawaii, taught in Rochester and, you know, became an uh, administrator for a school and simultaneously taught sign language and deaf culture and have been doing that for the past 20 years. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> it's, I think it's extraordinary that you have this ability to recognize what resonates with you and to follow that intuition. It's hard to, to learn to listen to that, oh, this is for you feeling. You have isolated and identified so many things that resonated with you. Um, what are some of the things you love about teaching sign language and deaf culture? What are some of your classes like? So I, my class is complete immersion. So it's always surprising to students when they come in and I'm not talking to them. I think they think that I'm mad at them. <laughs> <laughs> so they walk in and I'm just like nodding and, you know, I may point to a seat mm -hmm. or, you know, I may point to something that's on the board or what have you. And, and then I just start teaching the class and you know, in sign language and without voice. And I, you know, of course I have like written cues so that they know what I'm talking about or mm -hmm. what I want them to do, but there's no voice. And then they don't use any voice. And so then they start to rely on their other skills <laughs> because it's survival now. Right. Um, and it goes on like this. And this is how the first class always is. It goes on like this for quite a while. And then all, and then at one point I'm like, Okay, so welcome to American Sign Language. They're like, oh my gosh, you can speak because they don't know that they don't know if I'm deaf or not. They just know that I'm like I I'm, I am not communicating verbally, and right. so it's, it's it's a highlight of my day. <laughs> <laughs> it's a highlight of my day to have students kind of go through this because this is what it, what it's like for deaf people. You know, they don't hear anything. They miss a lot of stuff mm -hmm. um, unless they're with another deaf person. And so you, they have to pay attention. Like all those other skills really do get heightened because they have to rely on visual and they have to rely on sounds unless they're hard of hearing, which they can then sometimes depend on some sounds or if they have a cochlear implant and then they can kind of decipher some sounds or what some sounds are. Um, nothing is a surefire way, right, of um, making a deaf person hear, but it can help them to just sort of like maneuver through the world a little bit more. And that's a whole other like ball game. But it's oh, it, that is like besides that first day of class where the students get it. And so they know like what's going to be um, demanded of them this whole the, the entire semester. It's it, it really is just like fun. But the other thing is like when class is over and it's like two or three years later and a student comes to me and says, you know, Professor Welsh, like I was, you know, working and a dead person came in and I can't believe I remembered all those signs and thank you so much for, you know, teaching me and I really appreciate it. Though, like those are so few and far between, but it has kept me going for all these years because that one situation that that student had with that deaf person helped that deaf person to not have to struggle to communicate. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. And I, know, so, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. So that's just like that, just giving a couple more people a little, a little more accessibility is so, I feel like it's just so important because, you know, we always, sometimes we don't even like on a day-to-day -day basis, like we're not always thinking about deaf accessibility or blind accessibility or anybody's accessibility if we're able-bodied. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's just part of your world. Those two things, I think, the first day of class and 
always getting some feedback from students later on down the line where what I taught them had impact. I mean, it just it makes me feel so good and, and, and purposeful. Like I did something that is going to be in the world for, you know, that helped somebody in the world somewhere, even if I wasn't there. What do your students go on to do? Do they often go into professional work in deaf communities? Um, some do, but most are taking it for a language requirement. There that was makes a, sense. Yeah, it was some time in, I say the early, maybe like the mid 2000s or the early 2000s where American Sign Language was accepted as a language mm-hmm. that students can take. And it wasn't just like the Romance languages like Spanish or French or Italian or, you know, other like Japanese. They they had they could take now American Sign Language, especially for any students who have any challenges or disabilities mm-hmm. and you know, cognitively couldn't get like maybe, uh, you know, like the romance languages would kind of like default to being to being able to do a visual language a little bit better. Still a challenge because I have a lot of students who I have accommodations for still a challenge for them, but it's it's an alternative. You know, it's not just I have to be able to speak this language and memorize all this thing. I can do it in a mode that's a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um that's better for me, you know? So I, I always appreciate that the class was able to give that to to students as well. And students who just were like, I've always wanted to learn, or I did it in high school. I really want to learn more. And so that I get those students to come into class as well as some students who just are like, I need to take it for a language. And this seems like it'll be a fun way to do that. So I get the, the variety, I get a bunch of different people. I've had like maybe two or three students who have gone on to do more with American Sign Language. Um, And then I have a lot of teachers who use sign language in their class with their young students to keep them from like having outbursts. So they use sign language in a variety of different ways. That's incredible. It sounds like you really love what you do too. I do. I feel like I've been doing it for a while. So I think, you know, like with anything, like you get itchy to do like other things to see mm-hmm. like oh what else, what else can I learn but I'll always I think that I'll always do it in some way shape or form because I do I love it so much I love the richness of the deaf community I love teaching people about the deaf community um you know I have a lot of friends who um are deaf who are you know really successful um and that community is so like tight-knit mm-hmm. that it's I just think that it's it's a lot of fun. I always try to get my students to go where deaf people are and interact and make deaf friends because, you know, if you know the language, you'd be surprised. Like, deaf people are mad fun. <laughs> 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 they really are. <laughs> you know, like you go to a club and you're like, why is everybody sitting against the wall? Well, that's how they feel the vibration, you know, but they'll drink you under the table too. <laughs> <laughs> not gonna say all, just some. <laughs> Do you have any favorite stories from your classroom? I think that when I have one of the things that we do um, in my class is when we have the final. The final is always this is great. Um, the final is is often you can read a story um, in sign language, or you can uh, it's part of the final because my final is pretty intense. But you can do a song or a book. And I just love to see the songs that my students choose because they always somehow throughout the semester learn that I really love music. And so they pick songs that they think that I would like really, really enjoy. And I had some students do some really like great songs that they just like, they like just nailed it. You know, they just nailed it in terms of their interpretation of the song. And it was just like, I remember one of my students did a Miley Cyrus song. And it was just so good. I think she had all like all the all the people in like just everyone in the class just glued to her in terms of how she was like presenting. And I was like, you did an amazing job. I love those moments, not just because it's music, but it's it shows like at that point when it becomes the student who really gets the language Mm -hmm. and is not just, you know, doing a song word for word, but is interpreting the song, which is different because if I say something in American sign language or say something in English and I try, I can't say, if I say it word for word, it's not American sign language. It's called, um, 
seeing it's like seeing exact English. It's like signed English. So it's every single word in English signed. But if I'm doing American Sign Language, it's more of an interpretation, a lot less signs, and it's more concise and and definitely has more um, impact. Mm-hmm. So it's very different. And so it, when I see students do that, it's so, I feel like those are amazing. So those I think are really like kind of like some fun moments in class. I feel like during finals is really like where we have the most fun Yeah, because I have the most fun. I think that they're a little bit more nervous because they're like, oh gosh, I'm being evaluated. But um, I think that it's, it's still like a, a very fun, like once they finish, they're like, wow. And they see that themselves on videotape. They're like, wow, I really did that. You know, that's always so great. I feel. Hearing you talk about your final exams for your students reminds me of this viral video from like almost 10 years ago of an, of a sign language student who did the sign language performance of CeeLo Green's Fuck You. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And I completely blanked that, like, I remember the video so well. And every time I hear the song, I think of her performance. Like, she owns that song now. But I completely blanked that that was for an ASL class. What a fun final exam that you have to perform a song, especially because so much music contains slang and code. And you have to figure out how to represent that if there's not an obvious sign for it. Yes, exactly. And I get a lot of emails at that time. It's like, um, I don't know how to sign this. And I'm like, we think of what the sign is trying. Think of what the music is trying to say, because if you say that, if you say that instead of what is just written on the page, you'll do better at conveying what that actually means. You know what I mean? Um, instead of just saying, oh, I opened the door and somebody came through and, you know, versus I'm, I was, you know, I was startled. It's kind of like showing versus telling. And, um, oh my gosh. Yeah. Yes. You know what I mean? That's how I feel. Like that's ASL versus, um, signing in English or, or English in, you know, in terms of the word for word. Yeah. That makes, that makes sense. Yeah. So I feel like that that is a, is is a is a kind of a good analogy for it. It is. It is a really good analogy. I hadn't yeah. even thought of it, but it is showing and telling, but more showing. Yes, and it's so beautiful. You know, it oh. really is. Do you remember when um, Nelson Mandela passed away and they had the interpreter? Yes, and that interpreter, that big thing where the interpreter wasn't even signing like properly. Like so many people contacted me that at that time it was like, Jim, what is he saying? And I was like. I really don't, I don't know what he's saying. Like, I don't even know if, like, I couldn't tell you if it's not American Sign Language, I couldn't even tell you what he was saying. Right. Because <laughs> a lot of people assume that American Sign Language is universal and no, it's not. No, Everybody it's not. has their own sign language. And British Sign Language and American Sign Language, even though they're both English, are the most different. It's actually French Sign Language and English Sign Language that are closest because of the founders of American Sign Language and how they came to develop it. So American English and French Sign Language are very similar, but British Sign Language and American English Sign Language are very different. Correct. Wow. So it's not just extra U's. No. (laughs) (laughs) A couple extra U's in strange words that everyone says is spelled wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And it's always surprising when people hear that. And I was like, well, think about it. Lauren Clare and John Hopkins Gallaudet came together to create American Sign Language. So, you know, of course they would have that influence. And then eventually, like, British Sign Language came in, you know, like, they had their own way of communicating, of which course. is really, so interesting. Um, and then also the with not only the language, but the introduction of, you know, technology, and oh, yeah. how technology has impacted the language um, in terms of the terminology, in terms of the technology that is, you know, like the cochlear implants that help um, deaf hear, um, you know, pick up sounds because mm-hmm. um, they're not hearing from their ear. They're hearing from their brain, which is another, you know, very interesting thing or hearing aids and how those have become like really better and better as the years gone by as technology impacts texting especially when it comes to deaf culture, some of those things impact community, right? Because then people don't have to always get together to communicate. They still can communicate now through texting or things like that. So it does impact the, the, the greater community in terms of how they gather 
right? Of course. Before gathering was so much more important uh, to, to see the language, now you video conferencing and FaceTime and all this kind of stuff. So all these things impact languages. I like to think that in some ways it has made it better in other ways it has kind of like hindered. I think it happens in, in, in the hearing culture as well. You know, how texting and things like that kind of keep you a little bit detached from people. And when you get together, it's a different feel, you know? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I was talking to my husband this morning about how much he and I both hate having phone calls. <laughs> like we both hate talking on the phone now. And I was like, God, when I was a teenager and the phone rang and it wasn't for me, I was mad. Yeah. But now I- it's like my phone rings and it's not spam. And I'm like, oh, damn it. Because I and, and I realize why it is for me. Um, it's because I much prefer to have things written because I remember things better if I've read them versus hearing them. And so if someone's calling me about something, I'm going to have to go write it down anyway. But for me, this is so awful. I hate <laughs> I hate the on-ramp and the off-ramp of a conversation on the phone. Like with a text, it's noun and verb. Hey, right. going to go to dinner at eight? Yes. Okay, we're done now. With a, conver- with a, with a phone conversation, like, hey, how are you? What's going on? Like, I don't know. Skip, please. Skip that part. Yeah. <laughs> And yet, yet, I love recording my show, which is basically recording a phone conversation. That's right. Because it's I get so to, <laughs> it's, it's, I am a whirlwind of contradictions and I own this about myself. <laughs> I, love it. I love every part of it because I completely get it. You know? like, <laughs> I'm so glad. Not tech, okay. I'm um, coming over, blah, blah, blah. That's it. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Everybody expects a text to be short and, and concise unless you're having like group text and you're like going on and on. And then when you get on the phone, like sometimes when people call, I'm like, how rude, how rude is it of you to call me? Like who <laughs> calls anymore? Like who even calls anymore? And it's so true. Unless you're expecting the call, you're like, how, how dare you call me? And I'm like, when did we become this society? <laughs> But it's so true. Like the greetings and salutations are so like a little bit long winded when you're on a call. Oh, absolutely. There's a long on ramp and a long on ramp off ramp. And it's can't you can't just be like, OK, I'm done talking now. Bye. Like right. you can't well, go do this. Yeah, you got to. I'm going to let you, you go. go. Yeah. <laughs> no, like you, there's there's a very long off ramp. And then there's like the timing of calls and how that changes. Like my mother-in-law called at like 9.05 and my husband nearly had a stroke. He's like, who's dead? She's like, no, I'm just calling because I saw this video. And he was like, you do not call after nine unless someone has died. And I was like, I had my my face buried so no one would hear me laughing. I was dying. (laughs) And I'm like... Adam, when did we become these people who don't take calls after nine? I know. It's so, I mean, it's so interesting. Do you remember like being on the phone with people till like one in the morning? I used to fall asleep with the phone <laughs> under my head wedged into the pillow. <laughs> I know. And now it's like, oh my goodness. It's just, it, it really is testament to how things have changed. Isn't it? And I, I don't mind a phone call. I just am like, all of us, I, I just have to be expecting it. When mm-hmm. people just all of a sudden call me, I'm like, uh... You know, here I go. But it's like, I don't, I love talking to people. I love talking to people in real time. I do like talking to people on the phone. It's just that unexpected. I prefer to get an unexpected text than a phone call. (laughs) So I get it. I get it a hundred percent. But yes, we have definitely changed when it comes to that. I knew this was going to be a great conversation because you and I spent many hours sitting next to each other oh chatting in the W's. Just come and hang out and chat with us because it's fun. It's so true. They don't know, Sarah. They don't know. W's, I'm telling you. I know from sitting next to you that you are also very attentive to your fitness and you teach exercise classes. What have you learned about pairing writing and caring for your body as your careers have developed? What do you do to take care of yourself? I'm someone who, um, like, I love, like, in, in terms of fitness, like, it has kind of evolved into, like, a, like, total wellness and mindfulness about all the areas that impact, you know, you as a person, mm-hmm. impact your, your, you know, mind, body, and spirit, because they're all kind of interconnected, right? Oh, absolutely. And I'm somebody who, um, from a very young age, I've always had weight, 
and I've always wanted to lose weight and I've always gained weight back. So I kind of know that I live in this area where it's not necessarily like it is somewhat a yo-yo where I try to find a balance. But no matter what weight I am, I'm always exercising. I'm always eating healthfully. I sometimes will have those periods where I'm not eating healthy. Like I'm actually working on um, on a workshop right now from uh, related to mindfulness for writers because, and it's based around a deadline because I remember when I started to get deadline, I started to write a lot. I started to, it, like weight started to come back on slowly because it was constantly in front of the computer. And I wasn't thinking about you know, did I do my meal prep? Did I, you know, get in, you know, enough exercise today? Did I go outside? Have I been seeing my, my family and friends, you know, and all these things that were happening, I was just like focused on the words on the page and being so involved in that world. And so I started to look at how do I make this routine? How do I make this ritualistic? How do I make this how do I, how do I stay mindful about making sure that I get all those other areas Mm -hmm. and still be fit because you can be fit at any size. Like I hope people really get that. Like they can, you can be fit at any size. Yes. Fitness is not a weight. It's not a weight. They're not always linked that you're overweight and you're not fit. Sometimes you are fit, (laughs) you know, Um, a lot of times you are fit. So I always want to make sure that that's, that's a clear thing. So you, you know, fitness, like I do, I love my beach body programs, my Shanti, because he's so handsome <laughs> and he's so motivational. And so I make sure that I, you know, do work out. I do try to get fresh air and walk. Cause I love the walk. I also like to run. Um, and I just have to be mindful of where I'm at so that I don't hurt myself. And, you know, I make sure that I'm really following all the things that I need to do to, to stay safe when I'm, when I'm exercising and also focus on nutrition that is going to be helpful for my mind, body, and spirit. Um, and have a good time too. Like you'll see me, I'll be out at RWA and things like that. And I'll be, you know, have a nice meal with people or I'll have drinks. Like you have to enjoy your life because that helps your spirit. Right. But I love fitness. I love moving my body. The class that I taught was called size and it is a Shanti program, and I taught it in corporate America, and I taught it at a studio, and I love that class because it really, one, it combines something that I love, music and exercise, and it breaks it down so that you can like do like a dance routine like at the end, and it's so much fun, and people who did it with me enjoyed it so much. We had so much fun. I have so much video, um, which I think you might have seen on um, my Instagram. I have. Yeah. <laughs> And it's so much fun. And I'm like, see, that's what exercise is. That's how exercise it's should be. I know, like, whatever it is that you want to do, whether you want to lift weights, or you want to walk or you want to dance or you want to do yoga or Pilates or whatever it is that you want to do, you know, taking care of yourself can sometimes be very boring. And if you can make it interesting in some kind of way, I think that you'll you'll do always do better at it because it's something that you enjoy instead of something that you're like, oh my God, this is, I have to do this now. Like, So what are your steps for taking care of yourself? You're already so mindful of how you're feeling and what you're doing in a given moment. And you seem so attuned to the things that resonate with you. What are the things you do to care for yourself? Um, okay. So one of the things that I definitely, I have a morning routine that I try to stick to as best as possible, no matter what where I am, no matter what, you know, weight I am, no matter where I am, if I'm at a conference or anything like that, I try to, you know, I get up, I make sure that I drink a lot of water because that gets like your whole digestion going. I exercise and I meditate. Those things, everything, all else fails in my day. I always make sure that I get that in. And even if it's not a lot of exercise, even if I just like, you know, do like 10 or 15 minutes of walking, or I do an hour of workout, whatever it is, I make sure that I do those things in the morning, some stretching or something, but it's always those things that I do first thing in the morning. What is your meditation technique? I have started meditating recently, and I have tried different techniques. Some of them work on some days. My dog right now is not meditating, just for the record. (laughs) 
I love dogs. <laughs> um, what are some of the methods that work best for you? If you don't mind sharing, if it's a private thing, you absolutely do not have to share. Oh, I love sharing. I share all the time. Um, but I love to like, I, um, I said, I've, I learned to meditate, um, doing, it was called, um, yoga nidra. I was, I learned actually in Guatemala, I had gone to a retreat, a yoga retreat in the yoga forest by Lake Atitlan in Guatemala. And it's yoga nidra and it's all meditation and it's long and you sit on a mat or, you know, on the floor, you're somewhat supported for a really long time. Like it, you can be doing it for like, you know, 45, half hour, 45 minutes to an hour, you mm-hmm. know? And I loved that one because of course where you are is very picturesque and everything like that. But in order to make it work for me or to take that down a little bit to, you know, doing it every day or do it at anywhere, like I have to make it simple. So even if I just, I love a half hour meditation, but even if I just do 10 minutes of meditation, I sit in a chair, I close my eyes and, um, you know, I use the calm app right now, um, because the meditations are so varied and I can, whatever it is that I'm feeling at that time, I can kind of zero in on with the different meditations, um, that Samara Lovett has on her, uh, on, on her app. Mm-hmm. So I can just play that and, you know, I can listen, you know, I love the ocean, so I can hear the ocean in the background. And what I love about it is that she's not talking the whole time. She gives you space Mm -hmm. to really kind of just like be in, be with your breath. So I really just sit down in a chair. I, you know, I keep the lights dim and I make sure that, you know, nothing is like not anywhere where it's like too noisy. And then I really just sort of like sit there with my breath. And I have come to learn that my mind is going so fast all the time. And oh, that I, it is. I mean, it's so amazing. I've, and now I've come to the point where I really do appreciate being able to receive it and let it and let it go. Like I've gotten to the point where I can like, oh, here it comes. All right. I'm thinking yeah. that, you know, goodbye. And that's the thing. It doesn't have to be a lot of time. No. It really doesn't. And you can even be doing it walking. They have walking meditations if you need to be, if somebody who can't sit still needs to be active. It's just the act of being mindful of what you're doing. Are you taking a step? Are you, you know, look at a, looking at a flower, feeling the pavement, feeling your joints move? It's an active thing um, instead of just being focused on your breath. But you do come back to your breath with walking meditations. And they're all so interesting. But I feel like I get such a good recharge from meditating when I take it off the mat and like situations happen and then I can kind of like, I can kind of take a deep breath. I I do this with people now too, when people are telling me like, you know, really horrible things or things that are happening to them. It sounds like their life is in chaos. I just like take a really like huge deep breath that makes me more functional throughout the day. And I can do things and I can say, okay, if I stop forecasting my life, <laughs> I can maybe get this thing done. Because, you know, when you forecast, you sort of like stop seeing things in steps and your next step and you start seeing, you know, how things can kind of unfold that may or may not be true. So you have to kind of bring, it helps you really kind of bring it back and ground yourself, you know? Absolutely. Love it. Mm-hmm. So I always ask this question, what Ooh. are you working on and what are you reading that you want to tell everyone about? Ooh. Okay. So I am working on book three and it's now called the back on top series, um, which is the in, in tune and in rhythm. Mm-hmm. I'm working on the third book now. So that's in the incubator. And, <laughs> and I am also, um, working on um some other stuff i'm working on a soccer story right now um or soccer series right now that i absolutely love first things first is um doing um book three for everybody but book two is coming out in december so book three is actually like what i'm physically working on and what was the other part of your question what are you reading that you want to tell people about Ooh, okay. So I, I, I read a lot of nonfiction. Um, <laughs> Me too. 
I know, uh, because I feel like I get like inspiration from that too. So I'm reading a lot of nonfiction because I'm doing a lot of research for my workshop. But in terms of romance, I am reading Writing Her In. That's a Holly Trump book. That one's a lot of fun to read. But the other one that I'm... I've read it and I'm now that I'm listening to is um, Adriana Herrera's Dreamer. I'm listening to that one. And that is a treat to listen to. I don't know if anybody has listened to it, but it's such a treat to listen to because the actor, the voice actor is so good at doing all all these different voices. It's Ooh. like when I don't know if you've ever listened to um, Harry Potter on um, audio. It's also a treat. It really is a treat to listen to. And it's kind of like that for me. And I just like, I feel like every time it gets closer to like, oh, you only have two hours left, like get a little sad. (laughs) Because I know like the end is coming. So if you get a chance to listen to it, I mean, reading it is great, but I feel like listening to it is a real treat. Well, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me today. I've had the best time with our conversation. Oh, Thank yeah. you so much. This is so fun, so much fun. I feel like it's overdue. And I really do feel like people don't really understand like how much fun our conversations are when we're like sitting next to each other. Oh, time. gosh. Oh, my goodness. Like we just have like a really, really good time. Really come through people. Come. Through. Yeah. <laughs> come hang out with us. Yeah. This is so much fun. So I, I'm just like, this is so overdue. And I'm just like, so happy to have this time with you and, you know, talk with you and your, have your listeners listen on in. And that brings us to the end of this week's podcast. Thank you to JN Welsh for hanging out with me both while we talked for this podcast and at book signings. I hope you enjoyed hanging out with us. If you would like to find her online, you can find her at JN Welsh, W E L S H dot com. And I have a link in the show notes to her Spotify playlist. Should you like to sample some of the music that she talks about? This week's podcast is brought to you by Fallen by Rebecca Zanetti, which ticks a lot of boxes on the catnip bingo card. Best-selling author Rebecca Zanetti's second deep ops, Fallen, is sharp and dynamic, raves the New York Times. Brimming with action, suspense, and sensual tension, a talented hacker turned security consultant and her FBI-appointed bodyguard must fake an engagement to clear her father's name from a high-profile mob scandal. Fallen by Rebecca Zanetti is on sale now wherever books are sold. For more information, visit RebeccaZanetti.com. Every episode receives a transcript. I know many of you listen and read or do one or the other. Thank you to everyone in our podcast Patreon community who have supported the show and have underwritten this week's transcript. If you would like to join, patreon.com slash smartbitches. Monthly pledges start at $1. If you've supported the show with a monthly pledge of any amount, thank you very, very much. Your support means a lot. The music you are listening to is provided by Sassy Outwater. You can find her on Twitter at Sassy Outwater. This is a band called Sketch. This is their album Shed Life. And this particular track, and I looked up the pronunciation, so if I screw this up, please let me know, is called Oitcha Boogie. I hope I said that right. You can find it on Amazon or on iTunes or wherever you buy your funky music. Coming up on Smart Bitches this week. It's time for What You're Reading, our most expensive and popular post of the month. And now we do two of them by reader request. We talk about what we're reading, you tell us what you're reading, and then we build our TBRs to heights that have never been seen before. We also have a sponsored post next week from Adam and Eve with a discount code for 50% off and free shipping. So if you're looking for some uh, toys or accessories to spice up the nights that are growing longer in the Northern Hemisphere, this is an excellent opportunity. We also have reviews of new titles because October is a month full of books and we have some really great positive raving reviews coming out too. Plus a new rec league for all your goth heroine needs. Books on sale. Help a bitch out. I hope you'll come and hang out with us. I will have links to all of the things that Jen mentioned as well as all of the books and movies we talked about and links to some YouTube videos for the music that she was referencing when she was talking about DJing. They're all in the show notes at smartbitchestrashybooks.com slash podcast. And as always, I close with a terrible joke. Are you ready? This one's pretty dumb. I'm pretty excited about this one. What does a cloud do when it's got an itch? 
What does a cloud do when it's got an itch? It finds the nearest skyscraper. <laughs> this is so dumb. <laughs> skyscraper. <laughs> this joke is from S. Burgle on Reddit, and um, I spend way too much time in the dad jokes for because they're great. So on behalf of J.N. Welsh and myself and everyone else who hangs out with us on the W's, we wish you the very best of reading. Have a great weekend, and I will see you here next week. <laughs>